What is going on everyone? My name is Andy. Welcome back to another Euro 2024 fantasy video. In this one, it's the match day one preview. So I've gone through some of the latest lineup information, looked at predicted goals and predicted clean sheets, and then answered some of your questions as well. So if you enjoyed the video, make sure to give it a like, hit that subscribe button. Let's get into it. All right, let's start with the Netherlands lineup against Iceland and their friendly last night, because that's likely to be as close as possible to the first 11 that we're going to get for their game against Poland in match day one. They lined up with the back four, and it was Dumfries in the right back spot, not Frimpong, who we have seen played right wing during some of the friendlies. And Kuman did say he could see Dumfries right back and Frimpong ahead of him. But I think the fact that Jamie Simon started this game against Iceland is pretty telling. So I think if you're someone that's got Frimpong in your team, he's got to go. There is no guarantee that he starts. And interestingly, I think he is still one of the highest owned players in the game. Yeah, 34% puts him in the top five for total ownership. Obviously, he had a great season at club level, but I just think he's got to go. We've done freeze. If you've played World Cup 2022 uh, fantasy and Euro 2020 fantasy as well, you've probably had him in your team at some point because he's so attacking. But that was always from a right wing back position. Now, with the way the Netherlands set up, I'm sure Dumfries will still get a chance to attack, but I'm not sure he's going to be quite as good as he would have been in previous tournament still like him for Poland in match day one but obviously they come up against France in match day two so he's not necessarily someone that you'd want to keep for both of those games uh, and I guess the only other thing to point out Van Dijk scored again um, so he could be an option for six million but it's starting to feel a little bit expensive if he's not on penalties and the fact that Memphis Depay started again means he will probably take them uh, if he's on the pitch so Depay and Gappo both starting uh, Gappo off the left but I think if I was going to go for one at 7.5 it probably would be Depay. Again, don't read too much into friendlies. You could say that, you know, England softened Iceland up a little bit and that let the Netherlands win 4-0. But obviously, it was a good performance. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily expect that to happen throughout the group stage because they've got to play France. But first game against Poland, I think, looks pretty good for the Netherlands. So if you're looking to go for a bit of a differential, Depay up front, 7.5. Simon, 7, midfielder. And maybe Dumfries or Van Dijk as well. But I think there's probably better options for a cheaper price elsewhere and just to quickly point out as well which we already knew but Brogan is first choice goalkeeper and only 4.5 so if you're someone that's playing all chips in the group stages he looks like a good option all right let's talk about Germany next now we pretty much knew how they were going to line up anyway because Nagelsmann has been pretty consistent with his picks in the friendlies and he's also been very open he said that Neuer was first choice goalkeeper he said that Tar and Rudiger would be his centre-back partnership but according to Bill the first 11 for the game against Scotland has already been decided and they've put it out and you do get way more leaks for lineups in um, international competitions for some reason as we're going to see in a minute for England so this is what it's going to be Neuer in goal Kimmich, Tarr, Rudiger, Mittelstadt back four as we know Mittelstadt and Tarr great value at four and 4.5 million euro respectively then we've got Cruz and Andrich as the um, pivot then Musiala, Gundogan, Verts behind Havertz it goes on to say meanwhile full Krug, Sané and Gross are the players, oh, sorry, are the three players which Nagelsmann considers to be part of the extended start in 11 and thus have the highest chance of playing time. So those three are the most likely to be subs, uh, subbed on, you'd imagine. So Fulcrook possibly for Havertz, Sané for Musiala uh, or Verts, and Gross possibly for Gundogan. So I still think Germany, given that they're at home, the fixtures they've got are strong and they've got good value options pretty much all over the pitch. But someone like Gundogan, for example, who's still in my team, I'm a little bit worried about how early he could be substituted. He's not going to play 90 minutes most games, you would imagine. So he could even start coming off like 65, 70 minutes. So a number 10 with penalty still looks good, but he could get subbed early and therefore there might be better options at 7 million. But overall, I still think a double or a triple up um, for Germany looks good no matter what chip strategy you're on. But there you go. We've got the team and we'll probably get it for other... Um, countries as we get closer to the deadline as well not everyone's going to leak the whole team but there will be more information than we're used to for like the premier premier league for example so speaking of leaks let's go to england next now trent alexander arnold is a player that i've pretty consistently said that i would avoid because you just cannot guarantee that he's going to start although i did say in yesterday's overlooked video he had been given the number eight shirt and every other player one to 11 for england you would expect to be in the first 11 when they're fit so that was an indicator that he might be southgate's preferred midfield partner for rice and it does look like that's the case i wouldn't say this is a 
team leak, but it does feel like no smoke without fire. So Matt Law has said Trent Alexander-Arnold is in pole position to start as Declan Rice's midfield partner for England at the Euros. But Gareth Southgate will have his eye on a number of fitness issues this week. I'm not sure whether that is related to Trent because as far as we know, he's fine. It could just be other players. But either way, it looks like Trent might start. And Sammy Mockbell said Gareth Southgate set to continue Trent Alexander-Arnold midfield experiment this week as England boss is seriously considering starting the Liverpool start in the Euro 2024 opener versus Serbia. So it does look like he's going to start. I still don't think this is a guarantee, but like I said, no smoke without fire. He's been given the number eight shirt as well. Does that mean that if he starts against Serbia, he definitely starts against Denmark? No. Southgate might put someone else in there. There's still Wharton, Mainu, and Conor Gallagher that can play in that position. But if he plays well, there'd be no real reason to take him out. And obviously, the more they play together, the better that they will gel as an option moving forward into the latter stages, hopefully. I mean, I still can't see someone like Trent lining up against a France, for example. I think Southgate would probably move to someone like Conor Gallagher instead, who's probably a bit better defensively. But it looks like for the group stages, at least match day one, Trent is going to play. So I think he probably is worth the risk. I still see England as a pretty strong defence. He can be fairly attacking from that position. I still think he'd probably be better from a fantasy perspective at right back, but he can cause damage from that position. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I got to be honest, when I saw this, I put him straight in my team. I know I've said I would ignore him and I like Gay at 4.5 million, but if Trent's going to start for 5.5, I'm not sure I can turn that down. I mean, I'm slightly biased towards England, as you might have realized over watching all these videos and i do like to have a triple up if i can the 5.5 of trent all of a sudden it's starting to look pretty good not a guarantee that he starts against denmark but we will probably get information ahead of that game anyway because england are one of the teams where a lot of leaks come out and they're usually pretty reliable and early so yeah if you're looking to go for trent and you're worried about his minutes it does look like he's probably probably not guaranteed to start against serbia so I just wanted to go through some of the team predicted goals for the group stages from 11 5com This is not sponsored, but I will leave a link in the description if you want to check it out for yourself. Now, the teams predicted to score the most goals are the ones that you would imagine, right? So for the whole group stages, one to uh, match day one to three, it's Portugal and England at the top with 7.4, then Germany, then France, then Belgium. So obvious players to go for from those teams, Ronaldo and Fernandes from Portugal, probably Kane... And I would say Saka next, just because he's 8.5, as I've mentioned before. But Bellingham at 9.5, if you've got the, uh, the money, is a decent option as well. I am still fairly confident that Foden will be in that 11 for England. But I'm a little bit less confident than the, than the other two, right? So for Bellingham and Saka, I would say 99.99% sure they will start. With Foden, it's probably more like 90%. But I think he'll be in there, and he's 9 million. Germany, spoken about them a lot. Havertz, Gundogan, Verts, probably the best options. Musiala, if you've got a little bit more money to spend as well. France is probably just Mbappe. I think there's too much rotation to worry about going for anyone else. And then Belgium, you've got Lukaku, Trossard, and De Bruyne are probably the best options. Maybe Doku as well, but he takes up a forward spot. I think the interesting thing here, for match day one, they're all quite similar. So you can just go for whoever your favourites are. But Spain are quite high up. Now, their best match is Albania in, in match day three, and they got 2.5 uh, expected goals on this model. But they're also quite high for match days one and two, which I don't think you would expect. So in match day one, where their fixture is Croatia, they predicted 1.8 goals, which is only just behind Belgium at 2.2. And then against Italy in match day two, it's 1.7. Now, I'm not saying that you should go for Spanish attackers over those teams I've just mentioned, but if you were thinking about them, especially as a differential, because their players are probably quite low owned, I'd imagine. Like, let's look at um, Nico Williams. He is 3% owned. You've got your Mao, 6.5 million forward, who should start. He's 11% owned, so a bit more popular, probably because he's quite cheap. Uh, and also, you know, a Barcelona superstar already. But there is some differential options there that not a lot of people are talking about. And Spain are predicted to do quite well. And then also for mostly match day one only, Netherlands predicted two goals against Poland, which is pretty decent, and Italy against Albania. Now it is the same at two goals. Now for Netherlands, I think it's Xavi Simons or Depay are probably your best options. For Italy, I'm still a little bit doubtful about exactly who's going to start, but Chiesa should be nailed if you want to go for him. 
Uh, but I think I'm just going to double check here. Is he listed as a forward? Yeah, he is. So I just don't think you can go. I'd rather go for Skamaka at 7 million. Um, they're probably your best two options. But I think Italy, you're more looking at defence. So it is pretty much the teams you would expect. But I wouldn't completely ignore Spain. I think Netherlands look good for match day one as well. And so do Italy. I mean, Denmark, 1.7 against Slovenia. Someone like Hoyland could be a nice option at 7.5. And I think when you're looking at picking players in general, you, you need. we're going to talk about chip strategy later, but you need to decide whether you're using all chips in the groups or just going to use one. Because if you're using all chips, I do like taking a punt on, say, a 7.5 million forward instead of the standard Lukaku to then give you money to spend elsewhere. So it could be Havertz against Scotland or even Hoyland against Slovenia and then move them on for match days two and three and just target the fixtures. Because again, in match day two, it's all the top teams you would expect predicted to score the most. But even like a Croatia, 1.7, because they play um, Albania. Serbia, 1.6. I think they've got Slovenia. So there are potential punts that you could go for, like Mitrovic, for example. And then I know we're getting ahead of ourselves in match day three, but it might help you um, choose your, your strategy. There's a few less... Like, you've got Denmark match day one. You've got um, Serbia match day two. There's a few less teams in match day three, I think, to target outside of the obvious. But Spain, 2.5 against Albania. Netherlands is 1.9. I think that is against... I'm going to have to double-check that. Who else is in the... Oh, it's Austria, isn't it? Yeah, it's Austria match day three, yeah. So, the uh, Netherlands look good. If you're someone that wanted to limitless match day two, for example, you could load up on Netherlands players to go for Poland and Austria and just skip France. But I'm not sure many people are on that strategy. But that's predicted goals anyway. Let's take a quick look at clean sheets. So I think the clean sheet data is even more interesting than the predicted goals data because there's a few more nations outside of the top ones that you could look to target. And they've got some pretty cheap options to allow you to spend more money elsewhere as well. So for match day one in particular, Italy are predicted the highest chance of a clean sheet of 55%. And obviously, they're playing Albania. DeMarco just looks like a really good option at 5 million with that attack and potential as well. Next is Denmark at 45% against Slovenia. So Alexander Barr started the last two friendlies as right wing back. He's not a guarantee to start, but he's only 4.5 million. And you've got Joki Mailer at 5.5, who's been brilliant in previous tournaments for getting goals and assists. And they've got a good chance of a clean sheet in match day one. The only thing to say there is they play England match day two. So it's only 12% and then 27% against Serbia. So that kind of says that Denmark's not a particularly strong defense compared to a lot, uh, to two of the teams in the group. But against Slovenia, there's a pretty good chance there. Then it's Netherlands and Belgium at 42%. Now, Netherlands I quite like against Poland, but I do think Van Dijk at 6 and Dumfries at 5.5 if he's not playing as a wing. Like, he'll still get forward, I get it, but not playing as a wing back. They do feel maybe a little bit on the expensive side. Like, I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I would go there. May, maybe if you're using all chips in the groups, just get them for the Poland game. But given they've got France and a 14% chance of a clean sheet in that game, I wouldn't do it if you're on a limitless match day three strategy. With Belgium, they look really strong for the first two games. It's 42% match day one, 41% match day two. So it's Slovakia first of all, and then Romania. We've been through their defenders a lot, right? Fast has started... Lots of games now. He's probably going to start as a centre. About 4 million is a great option. Um, and Castagna at 5 million as well. I would look at both of those. And also you could go for Castiles in goal at 5 million. So Belgium have got lots of options in defence. Germany, home advantage. There's a question on that later on. 41% against Scotland in match day one. 43% against Hungary match day two. And then 33% against Switzerland match day three. Their defense looks strong. I've talked about them so much during the run-up to this tournament. I'm not even going to mention the names of the players that you should go for. But I would have at least one Germany defender. I've spoken quite a lot about how the England defense is pretty strong. These percentages probably say it's not quite as strong as I've made out possibly. 36% match day one against Serbia. 35% match day two against Denmark. I still don't think that's that bad, right? Like, if you think that Denmark have got, what is it? Let me just check here. A 12% chance, oh, sorry, that's against England. 27% chance against Serbia. For England, it's 36. It is the strongest defense in that group. And you've got someone like Trent at 5.5 and Gay at 4.5, Pickford in goal for five. There is some good options there. I still think England defense is pretty good. I know 
it maybe look the back four looks a little bit weaker than it has done in previous tournaments but i still think with the players you've got in front shielding like declan rice there is clean sheet potential there and the attackers are going to have so much of the ball that it is just going to be on transitions i think that they're mostly going to be hurt and that that worked for iceland and it could work again but i don't think england will give up too many chances so i still think they look pretty strong um, but their best game is match day three against Slovenia. 53% chance of a clean sheet in that game. And it's similar with Portugal. Their best game is match day three, but they're still 36% and 34% for match days one and two. So Cancelo, uh, probably the best option. Costa in goal as well. I'm just seeing if there's any other standard. It's pretty clear that um, Albania are not, uh, on the models at least, are not being given much of a chance because Italy 55% match day one. Croatia 52% match day two and Spain 55% match day three I mean the Spanish defense I've not uh, talked about a lot mostly because they've got Croatia match day one which is 31% chance of a clean sheet and then Italy match day two 25% maybe you could go there I think someone like um let me see let me just find the Spanish defenders just a second I think someone like Laporte is five million uh, Grimaldo obviously 5 million as well could be an option uh, a bit more attacking and then you've got Le Normand Le, 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 no, I, uh, I think you probably pronounce it something like that only 4.5 and as far as I know he will start correct me if I'm wrong in the comments below but I think he's going to start and he's only 4.5 I just don't like the fixtures that much and I also don't like having to say his name so that would probably be the last time I do that but Croatia and Italy on paper even though the clean sheet odds are not that bad I just don't necessarily rate it. Just a couple other teams to quickly go through here. So I've said that England match day one and two is 36 and 35%. Switzerland, 36 and 34 for match day one and two. Really like that. So you've got Fabian Scher nailed on uh, 4.5 million centre back. You've also got uh, a player that I've currently got in my team, and that is Vidmer, who is a 4.5 million wing back. Now he's probably not going to get as many minutes as Scher. But as long as he gets past the 60 for the clean sheet, probably a little bit more potential for attack and returns from open play. And they've got Hungary, Scotland, match day one and two. Uh, and also Ukraine, match day one is 36%. And match day two, 37. So you could look at some of their players like Zabani, uh, maybe Lunin in goal if you think that he's going to start as well. So there is definitely some cheap options there. Um, a lot of people have asked me about, just quickly, Turkey, 35% match day one. Um, what's the... Is it Bayinda, the goalkeeper at four million? I don't think he's going to start. I don't think he's the starting goalkeeper, so I just wouldn't go there. Uh, I'm not sure Turkey is necessarily a defence that I would want to target anyway, to be honest with you, but the four million goalkeeper dream, I think, is over for them. So loads of options to go for. I think this is a position where you can go a bit cheaper and get away with it more so than the midfielders and forwards. So if you are going to cheapen any position in your team, especially if you're only looking to use one chip in the groups, it'd probably be in defence. All right, let's get into some of your questions. So how many points would you need from your Germany captain to not change captaincy in match day one? So just to clarify again, in this game, you are able to change your captain every day within a match day to try and get the highest score possible. But remember, only one score will be doubled at the end of the match day, and that is whichever player you leave the captaincy on. Okay, so in match day one, it starts on Friday. You've then got matches on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. So there are five days within the match day. That is five potential captains. But if one of your captains, let's say Harry Kane on Sunday, got 20 points, then you would just stick. You wouldn't change it, okay? Now, with this particular question, a few things. In the group stages, you've got the highest amount of weaker teams, okay? You would imagine that most of the better teams will get through to the latter stages. Therefore, there'll be better defenses and maybe less goals. So the most goals are going to be scored in the group stages. And because there's five days in match day one, I'm more willing to gamble because there's so many players to come afterwards. Now, to put an actual number on this is hard to say, but I would want at least two returns. So if it's a defender, a clean sheet, and an attack and return, and if it's an outfielder, two goals or one goal and an assist plus maybe some bonus, so either that they're man of the match or they got some ball recoveries as well. But I think two returns would be kind of a minimum. You've got to gamble, right? There's only seven match days in total. 
And it's not often that you get like a free shot on a Germany captain, a free shot on maybe a Spanish or an Italian captain on the Saturday, knowing that you've then maybe got like a Harry Kane or a Lukaku or an Mbappe or a Ronaldo to come. So you've got to gamble, okay? One return is not enough. And to be honest with you, there'll be people out there that might get two returns, but no man of the match or, or ball recoveries or something like that. And they may still gamble to try and hit the hat trick. I don't completely hate that. I think the earlier on you are in the match day, the more reason there is to gamble, okay? So let's say my my Germany player gets like one goal. I'm definitely switching. No doubts about that. I wouldn't even have to think about it. I go for my Italian defender. They get a clean sheet but nothing else. I'm gambling again because I've got Harry Kane on the Sunday. Now, if I get to, I don't know, like if Harry Kane gets a brace, you know, so two goals, maybe picks up a man of the match, Will I gamble on Mbappe getting a hat trick? Probably not, but you could do if you wanted to. If Mbappe got a brace, there's no way I would gamble on Ronaldo or Fernandez getting a hat trick. There's only one more opportunity. It's just not enough. So essentially, and it's the same for match day two, although for match day two and three is only four days, but the, the same principles still apply. The earlier in the week, the more I'm going to gamble, especially when the better players in my team are to come. Okay, So it probably would be a Germany or Croatian player on the Wednesday, I know I've got Harry Kane to come on the Thursday. I know I've got Mbappe to come on Friday. And then again, Lukaku or Ronaldo or Fernandez to come on Saturday. So I'm more willing to gamble early on. Uh, I, I don't have an exact figure in mind, but I would probably want two returns plus a bit of bonus from somewhere else. And that would probably be enough. And obviously it depends um, who you captain as well, right? Like if a defender gets a clean sheet, and gets a goal well those goals are worth more than a forward and so they could hit like 12 15 but like 15 points even on the first player of the day uh sorry the match day i'd maybe stick um so yeah 15 i'm definitely sticking i think like eight seven eight nine no way uh 10 11 12 probably not enough either until you get further down and obviously if you gamble and it doesn't pay off so be it right so if i don't know let, let, let's say demarco gets nine points and then Mbappe gets 10, and then you get... Sorry, um, I'm on match day two. Sorry, let me go back to match day one. Let's say DeMarco gets nine points against Albania. I'm definitely gambling on Kane. If he gets 10, I'd probably gamble for Mbappe. And if he only gets eight or nine, I may just stick. But again, I'd probably just go for it because Portugal got Czech Republic. So I'm gambling quite a lot. I think 15 maybe is a definite stick. Uh, 12, 13, possibly if it's from someone later on in the week. Uh, in the match day, I should say, but not if it's someone early on. So why is no one talking about Tony Cruz and his free kick abilities? Now, he is, of course, a great player that can go and get you some attack and returns, but ultimately he's going to sit a little bit deeper in that Germany team than some of the other really good value attackers that you've got. And as we've spoken about a lot before, Germany are one of the strongest teams for the group, and they've got great value players. Misselstadt, 4 million, Tar, 4.5 in defense. Even if you only wanted to go for one of them, you've still got Gundogan at 7 playing further up the pitch than Cruz and on penalties. Like Tony Cruz is 6.5. I think that's the main reason not many people are talking about him. He could absolutely smash a free kick, and we've seen it before. But I think I'd rather pay 0.5 more for Gundogan and maybe even a million more for Verts, who's definitely going to be more attacking from open play. So Cruz goes down as one of those players that's definitely not terrible, right? If you wanted to go for him, you absolutely should. But I think even at his price point, if you were looking outside of Germany, someone like Rodri, who's on penalties for Spain, is arguably a better option. All right, question about chip strategy. Why is everyone saying limitless match day three? Most big teams would be through and would rest players, you'd think. There was another question that came in asking me to go through different chip strategies. But realistically, there is not a huge amount to talk about here. You've got two chips, wildcard and limitless. Uh, there's seven match days in total for two of those. So match day one and the round of 16, you get unlimited transfers anyway. And when you start getting to the semi-final and the final, you don't want to be using chips. There's not enough teams left. So realistically, these two chips have got to be used in match day two, three, or the quarterfinals. That's all you're deciding on. You're either using them both in the groups or you're saving the wild card for the quarterfinals. You wouldn't want to use the limitless because you'd want to wildcard knowing which teams are likely to go through to the semi-finals and beyond. So that's all you're really deciding. There's not much to go through here. Um, as I've said before, 
The most weak teams will be in the group stages. That's where the most goals will be. There's absolutely every reason to use both chips in the groups to target different players in particular match days. So again, like I said earlier, you could go for Hoyland and a Danish defender for match day one, but you might not want to do that for two and three. By using all your chips, you can do things like that. But I do think there's enough cheap players from good teams that uh, that in particular for Euro 2024, get my words out properly, allows you to save that wild card until later. Why might you want to save your wild card? In case from the round of 16 to the quarterfinals, there's a few upsets. So for example, right, let's say Italy get to the round of 16, you load up on three of their players because they've looked really good and they're probably going to have a good quarterfinal game, although I think it would be against England. But either way, right, let's just say you, you load up on Italy. It's just an example and they go out. Well, suddenly you've got three players to deal with and you only get three transfers between the round of 16 and the quarterfinal. So it all depends how happy you are having one team for match days one and two. And obviously you've got the chip to fall back on. If things go really wrong, you can just use your chip that you were going to save in the group stages. Um, but then maybe your match day one team wouldn't be quite as good as it would be. Coming back to this question, by the way, why is everyone saying limitless match day three, but there could be rotation? Yes, as I've said before, Part of the benefit of a limitless chip is the unlimited budget, but part of the benefit is just being able to change your team. You do not want to save your limitless chip for later on, like in the knockout rounds. You want to use it in the groups. So realistically, it's match day two or three. So the reason that I'm looking at match day three is because I can load up on Belgium, England, Germany, Portugal, etc. for match days one and two. And then I can use the limitless to try and guess what that rotation would be. Yeah, I probably wouldn't use the unlimited budget part of that chip, but it's still got some value either way. Like I Basically, I think my team in match day two can stand up fairly well to anyone that uses their limitless chip that week. That's my hope. So yes, part of it is the unlimited budget, but part of the benefit is also just being able to change your team. And if you guess that rotation correctly, there's a lot of differentials that you could you could have that that's it basically and by the way it it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone will get rotated and not all the big teams will necessarily be through i think at the last tournament england had four points after the first two which pretty much puts them through given that third place gets through uh in this tournament as well but either way even without the six points going into match day three they still rotated so it will be difficult to guess that rotation but i'd rather do it with a chip than not and i don't think i need to use a chip in match day two that could be wrong and there may be no upsets between the knockouts and the court uh, sorry the round of 16 and the quarterfinals but that's just the way i'm going to play it. at the end of the day going back to what i originally said you've got you've got two chips to use in three match days like there's not really much of a discussion here use them in the groups if you want if not save it to the quarterfinals it really depends on how um all in you want to go on the, in the groups and if you do absolutely go for it i've done it before it's great lots of fun lots of different players you get to choose from i'm just choosing to do it a little bit different this time so is there any point in having two premiums playing on the same day for example mbappe and lukaku now i have touched on this briefly in other videos so yes match day one on the monday belgium play slovakia and france play austria so lots of people are going to have mbappe you don't necessarily need like a lukaku or a de bruyne for captaincy and it's similar in match day two so on the saturday Belgium have got Romania. So again, you could have a De Bruyne or a Lukaku, but you're probably going to have Ronaldo or Fernandez for Portugal who play against Turkey. So you don't necessarily need two premiums from each of those teams. Essentially, you want to have a decent enough, if not the best captaincy option every day because you're able to switch. Of course, you don't have to. If you get a good score, you don't need to twist on captaincy, but you want the ability to be able to gamble to get more points, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that you need a 10 or 11 million euro player every day. So the first day is Germany, Scotland. If you go for a Germany attacker that's not Musiala, they're all 7.5 or below. So getting one of those players in, or even captaining one of the cheap German defenders, is not hurting the budget for the rest of your team. It's similar on the Saturday, right? Even if you go for a Spanish attacker, it's probably not going to be Morata. Not many people are talking about him. So they're like 7, 7.5 or below or you could just go for an italian defender great chance of a clean sheet against albania so for the first two days no one's really eating up your budget for me then it would be kane on the sunday and mbappe on the monday and probably fernandez 
on Tuesday. So there's no need for Lukaku, but if you've got all your captains set and you've got the budget left over to get Lukaku and you think he's the best way to spend that budget, there's no problem with doing that, right? You're trying to spend money to get points. And if you think, I've got all those captains and I can have Lukaku, there's really no harm in that, right? You, you wouldn't just drop to a cheaper player just for the sake of the fact he plays against France. And I think because of the way the pricing is, you are probably going to have one leftover premium, essentially. And look, what happens if you get to the Monday and Mbappe's injured or something like that, or he's not in the team because he's got a bit of a knock and they just want to save him for match day two? Then you've got Lukaku as a backup. I wouldn't start worrying about backups massively for what it's worth. Um, most people will have a couple of options every day anyway. But that's something to think about. And it's similar in match day two, right? You look at the the first day on Wednesday. Again, it's probably going to be a Germany player. They're quite cheap. It could be Harry Kane on the Thursday. It could be Mbappe again on the Friday. And if you've got enough space to have a Portuguese and a Belgium attacker, there's just no issue, right? At that point, once you've got your captain set, it really just comes down to how you want to spread the budget around. So my team, for example, I've got Havertz and De Bruyne. It could be Lukaku and a, a German midfielder instead. But either way, having that De Bruyne or Lukaku position is not getting in the way of the rest of the team. So it's certainly not essential to have two premiums playing on the same day. But at some point, you've got to spend your budget. And if that's the best way to do it, then you should go for it. If you've enjoyed that video, make sure to give it a like and hit that subscribe button if you haven't done so already. Rate five stars if you listen on podcasts. Tomorrow, I'll have my team selection video. And then probably on Thursday or Friday, I might do like a final thoughts to answer any other questions that I've not gone through in this video, any more up-to-date team news, and obviously just a quick look at what the draft is looking like because it's changing all the time. But I think tomorrow's team selection will be as close as it's going to get, I think. And then it's just swapping like 7 million midfielders around and stuff like that. Anyway, I'll leave that video there. Thanks for watching. Uh, check out team selection tomorrow and I'll catch you then.